Hello, friends, and welcome once again to the 3ABN Worship Center located here in southern Illinois at the Thompsonville Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're glad that you've chosen once again to tune in. And uh, we know that the Lord has a blessing in store because we're going to open His Word again tonight as we did last night. As you know, if you've tuned in last night, this is the second in a five-part series on the topic of last day events. And I want to encourage you to invite a friend. And once again, if you're in driving distance, we do need some live bodies. We have people that are here, but your presence would greatly be appreciated. And uh, we're going to ask the Lord tonight to bless our hearts as we turn to his word. As you may remember last night, the topic was entitled The Final Countdown. Tonight, the title is The Final Stage. And tomorrow night, we're once again back at 7 p.m. Central, so don't forget that. If there are those that may have forgotten 8 p.m. tonight, call them now before we get into the message and remind them that it is on the air. Tomorrow night's message is entitled, The Final Coalition. And then Saturday morning at 11 o'clock, it is entitled, The Final Apostasy. And on Saturday afternoon at 3 p.m., it is entitled, The Final Act. Every one of them, we're relying on God's Holy Spirit to be the guide and the power and the one to teach us. Now, I'm preaching less and teaching more. I believe there's a need to be taught. What exactly is happening around us has a whole lot less to do with what's happening in the world, and I believe a lot more to do with what's happening in the Christian church. So turn your ears on and ask the Lord to direct your ears, your eyes, and your heart. So let's bow our heads tonight and ask him to guide us. Father in heaven, we thank you for the willingness on the part of those that have tuned in to hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Lord, I know that once again I'm just a human vessel, and I do pray that tonight, once again, you will impart to me the clarity, also the presence of your Holy Spirit. To teach, Lord, is a great responsibility. To preach is a great call on one's life, and I ask tonight that I'll be less considered, and Christ will be the one that is considered. His voice will be heard. So take these words and bring them to life. And find that intended heart looking for truth and looking for Jesus. And this we pray in your precious name. Amen. Tonight we're going to open with a Bible text. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. A very important text. And when I thought about the five titles for the series, as you know the theme, the overall theme is the last days, when I thought about the titles, I was down in the Virgin Islands and I was sitting there saying, Lord, what can I preach on about the last days? There's so much to say. And as I asked the Lord, as I woke up one morning, I said, Lord, what do I title the individual topics? What do I say on night to night? And the Lord gave me the five topics and told me to use the word final over and over and over and over again. Because I do believe we're living in the final hours of Earth's history. I believe we're living in the final days. And as I said a moment ago, I want to reiterate this, more of the things that are happening in the last days has to do with what's taking place in the Christian church. There are not a whole lot of changes in the world. They are happening with greater intensity and on a larger scale. There are more earthquakes and more volcanoes erupting and uh, more intense storms and more crime and more violence. We talked about those things last night. But if I were the devil, which I'm not, amen, somebody... I would really aim at the very structure and organization that God has built for my defeat. I would do all I can in my power to try to bring down the only thing on earth that God really loves. He doesn't love the casinos. He doesn't love the movie theaters. He doesn't love the gambling hells. He loves the church. And if I were the enemy, I would like a coach on an opposing football team. I would study the tapes of every church member study the loopholes, try to find a way to get in, just like he studied Eve in the Garden of Eden. If you look at that, there was a woman in the very beginning at the entrance of deception, and there is a woman at the end, at the closeout of deception. The devil attacked a woman in the very beginning. He's going to attack a woman again. The woman in the end is the church. So he has been focusing on the church for thousands of years, and now he's at the height of his attempt to deceive, to kill, and to destroy. That's why this verse is so vitally important. 1 Peter 4 and verse 7. Listen to what a converted apostle says to us. He says, and let's read this one together. 
He says, the end of all things, what? Is at hand. Therefore, be what? Serious and watchful in your prayers. You know what that means? When you, when you say your prayers for your toast in the morning, you're not as serious as when a crisis comes your way. I mean, honestly. He is saying, pray as though we're living in a crisis hour. He's saying, pray as though your life depends on it. As one person put together the acronym P-U-S-H, pray until something happens. What happened on the day of Pentecost happened as a result of prayer. At every stage in the conversion and the power of his apostles or his prophets, it happened because they prayed. The way that Jesus received his strength for his trial, he prayed, he beseeched the Father. And that's why Paul the Apostle says we ought to pray without ceasing. Not only kneeling down, but be in a constant attitude of prayer. Because we're not safe for a single moment without the power of prayer. But in light of the last days in which we live, we have to be serious. We have to be serious and we have to be watchful in our prayers. I remember when I lived in California, my wife and I, when we lived out there together, that's a good thing to do when you have your wife to live together, right? We lived in Northern California. But before we moved there, we lived in Orlando, Florida. And uh, having never been to California up until that point, uh, there were no GPSs, you know, no satellite units, just a good old Rand McNally map. And so having never been there, having never driven that far, uh, we had our old rickety 1976 Toyota Corona, and I've talk, talked about that car a thousand times, the, both of the fenders. Uh, that was a car from New York City, and because of all the salt on the streets of New York, both of the fenders had cancer. And they were rusted from the bottom, and when you drive down the highway, the fenders would pull the car to the left and to the right as a good gust of wind caught the front of the car. But I remember packing up that vehicle and then taking that McNally map, Rand McNally map, map, and photocopying every page from Orlando, Florida, all the way to Placerville, California. It was a lot of pages. I stapled them together. I highlighted them. And was, we had never seen the Pacific Ocean before, but the Pacific Ocean was on the West Coast. In order to see it, we had to get to the West Coast to see the Pacific Ocean. My wife got used to reading the map, and so as we, as we looked at the mile markers, she would tell me what the next city coming up would be. Texas and the small cities along the way all through the southern states and right up the uh, northwest coast. And I remember very well, each page represented a stage in our journey. After three days and almost 3,000 miles, we caught a glimpse of the Pacific Ocean for the first time. What a sight it was. But it said to us, that we were on the final page of our journey, at the final stage in our journey. We couldn't see the ocean until the final stage of the journey. It was impossible to see the ocean until we got to the west coast. So, because we were on the west coast, we can see the Pacific Ocean. Because we were near the final stage of our journey, the ocean was now within view. Let me take that to the next level. These are not the last days just because of the signs. But because we are living in the last days, these are the signs of the last days. Let me say it another way. The signs that we see today could not appear until the last days. The signs simply confirm we are at the final stage in our journey. Let me say that one more way. The signs of the last days could not appear at any other time, any more than we could see the Pacific Ocean from Florida. So why are we seeing the signs? We are seeing the signs around us because we are living in the last days. They could not appear at any other point in human history. That's why the words of Jesus are relevant in John 14, verse 29. He said... And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. All the things that are happening are for us to believe. I believe we're living in the last days. Anybody else? I believe we're at the final stages, and I'm excited. And you'll find out over the next couple of meetings that what is more relevant about this series, and I would hope to say not necessarily completely unique, but what I've sought to do is focus less on what's happening in the world and more of what's happening in the church because the world is... 
In other words, in a football game, I could care less what the people in the stands are doing. I'm more concerned about what the other team is doing. I'm more concerned about what, do, what they're doing in the huddle, what signs the coaches are making, what kind of plays they're about to run, and how hard they're going to hit me. We are on the field. The church is on this side, and Satan and his host are on that side. And the signs of the last days have a lot more to do with what Satan is doing in the church than what he's doing in the world. Notice why we can look with assurance to the signs and know that we are in the last days. Isaiah the prophet says in Isaiah 46 and verse 10, he says that God is able to declare the end from the beginning and from how far back? Ancient times, things that are not yet done. In other words, where we are today was predicted thousands of years ago. The final stage was constructed from components manufactured by prophecy. By what word did I say? By prophecy. Prophecy is our Rand McNally map. Prophecy is our mild markers. We know where we are because prophecy is reliable. And it's only reliable because God is reliable. It's His Word. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. When prophets wrote these words down, I want to say to you, none of the prophecies came from men. They were simply the ones who wrote it down. 1 Peter 1 and verse 20 says it this way, Knowing this first is of any private interpretation. Now, when I think about that, I think about preachers nowadays that in the middle of their sermon they say, Oh, I just got a prophecy. You better be careful if that's the kind of preacher that you are under. Because God doesn't just shoot prophecies into people's heads without somebody to check it out, without somebody to verify whether or not that's from God. Amen? A whole lot of that nowadays. I remember giving my, first, giving my first Revelation seminar, and I'm moving fast tonight because I have a lot to cover, so listen like a New Yorker. If not, you can get the DVD. But I remember giving my first Revelation seminar. There I was, a young preacher, in my one-and-a-half-year period of my first church. I was so nervous I lost 10 pounds. You could look at me and tell, I, don't, I, don't, I can't afford to lose 10 pounds. But I was totally enthusiastic, totally energetic, we lived in Weaverville, California, up in the mountains of Northern California, 2,500 feet above sea level. And in our town, we had 16 churches. We had more churches than we had bars. Not a bad thing, but it was quite a controversy to begin a Revelation seminar in a church where all 16 churches taught 16 different things at least. Well, I found out, I said to the city uh, fathers, where can I put advertising? They said, anywhere. I said, are there any advertising restrictions? They said, there are none. Oh, I took advantage of that. I put stickers in mailboxes. I put stickers in phone booths. I put stickers on store windows. Everywhere you went from, from east to west in Weaverville, you would see some kind of sign indicating that a prophecy seminar was coming up. I even had a banner made that crossed Main Street from one, can you imagine, across 149 from one side of the street to the other on two buildings, this big old huge banner Revelation seminar beginning and all the nights and the titles up there. People going through on their way to the west would see it. People on their way to the east would see it. And on the opening night, the, the town hall was jam-packed with pastors from every denomination. <laughs> I never forgot that. After about the first week, we moved the series of meetings to our church and the controversies began. Every church, five churches in the town started prophecy seminars. All of them for the purpose of what? Taking people away from my seminar. And the town was kind of like this. If somebody drove up to your church and they had a car uh, like a Honda Accord with a, with a black front uh, uh, mask on it, everybody in town would know exactly who that car is, who that car belongs to. Everybody would know, hey, that's Dee's car at a Baptist church or that's John's car at, a, at a, an Adventist church. Everybody knew whose car was there and the preachers watched and observed that very carefully. So they all began having a revelation seminar. The Baptist church, even the Catholic church, my good friend, Pastor John Lawrence, I don't call anybody father but God, amen, somebody. He had a seminar and after my meetings were done, I said, Pastor Lawrence, what does your church believe about prophecy? He said, what does your church teach about revelation? You know what he said to me? Actually, our church doesn't have a position on revelation. I said, so why did you have a prophecy? And he smirked. Because they wanted to keep people from hearing what I had to say about Bible prophecy. 
And you know, friends, that's exactly why we have to keep in mind that no prophecy that occurs is of any private interpretation. Look at the next verse, 2 Peter 1, verse 21. Not a single prophecy was born in the mind of men. Very careful nowadays when you have all these prophecy churches and prophecy programs and prophecy CDs that people are telling you how to be prophets. That's not the way that God does it. The Bible says, for prophecy never, what's that word, friends? Never. Prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by who? The Holy Spirit. Man cannot reveal what he cannot see. Only God can see the future. In the courts of Babylon, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar these words, Daniel 2, verse 28. Notice what he said to a great king. He said, there is a God where? In heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the king what will be in the latter days. So when a prophecy is fulfilled, it is a reminder that God wants us to know. God is not going to allow anything to happen unless he reveals it to his people first. Notice Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. The Bible verifies this. The first word there is surely. Notice what it says. Surely the Lord God does nothing. Does how much, friends? Nothing, unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Get that. God does not reveal his secrets to people that don't serve him. God does not reveal his secrets to those who do not obey him. Acts chapter 5, verse, 20, verse 32 says, God reveals his messages to those who obey him. God does not reveal it to those who do not obey him. Matter of fact, one of the most significant prophecies in the Bible that confirm that we are in the final stages of earth's history is in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2. God outlined the four major kingdoms of the span of human history. There in Daniel 7 verse 17, we read these words. These great beasts, or those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of where? out of the earth. Very quickly, for those who know Bible prophecy, and by the way, this is not about breaking down that prophecy in detail. I'll cover that spanning over the next few meetings. But we have Babylon, symbolized by the lion and the gold. We have Medo-Persia, symbolized by the bear in Daniel 7, and the silver in Daniel 2. We have the leopard-like beast, or the bronze image of the statue, symbolizing Greece. Then we have that fourth one, very important for our meetings. We have the fourth one that was iron in the metal man and it was a great and dreadful terrible beast that had iron teeth brethren I tell you what if I saw a bear a lion or a leopard I wouldn't be terribly frightful but if I saw a great and dreadful and terrible beast with iron teeth and iron claws breaking everything in its path I would run to mama what do you say I would run for my life I wouldn't even want to see that in a zoo because something with iron teeth could break through iron bars that's what the Bible said. Great iron teeth. And look at verse 23 of Daniel chapter 7. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms, and shall devour how much of the earth? The whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. And at the very height of Rome's reign, it was so significant, its impact religiously was so significant that Protestant reformers noted that Rome symbolized a system of Antichrist. Now I want you to put your ears on now. Because in an attempt to lead the world to believe that the Antichrist was only a character of the future, Rome began a 400 plus year campaign of deception. They sought to come up with a theory to push the Antichrist to a single man way down toward the end. It was called the secret rapture. It was formulated in the year 1585 by a Jesuit from a city named Salamanca. His name was Francisco Ribera. He lived from 1537 to 1591. He also had a fellow Jesuit by the name of Luis de Alcazar. He was also from Seville. The difference between these two guys is one was a futurist, the other was a preterist. A preterist is somebody who says all these prophecies are in the past. Well, the people weren't buying that. So Francisco Ribera came up with one that says the Antichrist is coming way down in the future. So he picked a single verse in Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 says it this way. 
In that, there's a sound of a trumpet heard, and then John says, and I heard a voice say, come up here. And Francisco Ribeiro said, ah, that's a good place. So he said, that voice that says, come up here, is actually calling the church out of the world. So he used that to begin to build what's called today the secret rapture. But if you read verse 2 in Revelation chapter 4, you begin to see that who was being called up there was John the Revelator. And then he says, I was caught up in the Spirit. God was simply calling John into vision, not calling the church out of the world. But the goal of the Jesuits was to do this, to take the heat off of Rome during the Protestant Reformation. But Martin Luther, one of the Protestant reformers, Huss, Zwingli, Calvin, Melanchthon, they began to rise up and to protest all the errors the church was teaching. And during the 4th century, sorry, during the 15th century, they began what's called today the Protestant Reformation. But I want you to notice the way that Satan put this structure together. I'm going to show you actually 10 steps tonight on how the secret rapture has come to where it is today. I want you to note the screen, the first step. It began with a man by the name of Francisco Ribera, who taught that Rome was not an antichrist system, and that the secret rapture would occur before the antichrist reign, before the seven-year tribulation, and he published his findings in 1593 in a manuscript. After he died, his manuscripts was kept by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. S. R. Maitland. He was appointed the keeper of the manuscript in Lambeth Palace in London, England. When he read Ribera's views, he republished those in 1826, again 1829 and once again in 1830. That was the second stage, if you notice, the second stage in the transforming of this prophecy into something nowadays that is not supported by the Bible. But the third phase was a man by the name of Emmanuel Lacunza. He was a Jesuit from Chile. He lived in the 17th century, from 1731 to 1801. He supported Francisco Ribera's beliefs about the rapture, and he published his writings in 1827. But get this, listen carefully. Instead of putting on his published writings, Emmanuel Lacunza, he published it under a fictitious name. He used a rabbi's name that he came up with. He used the name Juan Yosafat ben Ezra. So when the next person who read his views about the secret rapture, they thought that it was written by a converted Jew. And they said, oh, the Jews have embraced the rapture theory. The man that thought it was taught by a Jew was a man by the name of Edward, Edward Irving. He was the next stage in the formation of the secret rapture. Minister Edward Irving. He contended that Lacunza's writings were the work of a converted Jewish scholar, and then he embraced it as it's called today the pre-tribulation rapture. I'm teaching now, so follow carefully. Those who followed Edward Irving's convictions were called Irvingites. What were they called? Irvingites. However, here's the point, because of his contemporaries, they began to see what he said and what the Bible says, and because his teachings were not supported by the Scripture, he was put out of his church. They dismissed him from the Church of Scotland. They said, you can't teach that and be a part of the Church of Scotland. But you know what he did? Instead of dropping the teachings, he began his own church. He began what was called the Catholic Apostolic Church which was the foundation for what is now today the Pentecostal church. This is history. This is clever history. What I'm telling you is recorded. You can follow it yourself. But after him came a young teenage girl by the name of Margaret MacDonald. That was the next stage or the fifth stage in the conveyance of the secret rapture. In the 1830s, this young Scottish girl said that she had visions. She claimed to have a vision that revealed to her that the secret rapture was true. But prior to her claim, Edward Irving claimed also to receive a vision about the secret rapture. So what happened was, because of her vision, Edward Irving was convinced that he was on the right path. But there was a sixth phase to the conveyance of the rapture. A man by the name of John Nevin Darby. By the way, what I'm covering you, I, when, the, when the movie The Rapture came out, or the, uh, what do they call it? Yeah. Left Behind, when that came out, I was living in California. 
Christians were standing on the roads giving out free tickets to their churches to show this movie, the Left Behind movie. But what they didn't know, and this is something that many that own the book would do well to do, turn the book around if you own it and look at the very bottom of the back of the book in small, almost hard to read letters is this single word, fiction. It's Christian fiction that has taken the church by fire storm as doctrinal integrity. Every single book on the back, small little letters, fiction. Check it out. If you got it on your shelf, pull it off and see it. And what, what upsets me is that it's sold in the Christian bookstore. Even though there's a big old sign over the top of that says fiction, people still believe it as though it's doctrinally sound. So John Nevin Darby, he embraced the secret rapture theory because he was a follower of Dr. S.R. Maitland, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He embraced it. But his contemporaries also said to him, this is not scripturally sound, it's not based on the Bible. And they encouraged him to abandon it. It was then labeled Darbyism. He was also called the father of the modern dispensational theory. In other words, you've heard the phrase dispensations. They said the dispensation of law, then the dispensation of grace. There is no scriptural support for dispensationalism. It was put together by John and Darby on the foundation of the teachings of Francisco Ribera, whose main goal was to take the eyes of the people off of the Roman Catholic Church during the Dark Ages. Darbyism was published, and Darbyism is alive and well today, but that's not the last stage. When John Darby heard about Margaret MacDonald, he also visited her. And he was convinced that her revelations were genuine and it further strengthened his support of the dispensational view of the secret rapture. But it continued. This was very clever. This was probably the most magnificent step taken to give life and security to the rapture theory. The next stage, the seventh phase, was introduced by a man by the name of Cyrus Ingersoll Schofield. Hold on to your hat. Some of you already have your eyes open. He lived from 1843 to 1921. He embraced Darbyism, which was the foundation that he got from Francisco Ribera, and both of them were teaching on the secret rapture. In 1909, what year did I say? 1909. The false teaching of the secret rapture received its largest push because Cyrus I. Schofield created the very first Schofield Reference Bible. I have a slide of the Reference Bibles. When it was created, it was embraced as the Book of Books. Now hold that there for a brief moment because I want you to see something. On the far left is the Schofield Study Bible in blue for the New International Version. In the center is for the New King James Version. And the black cover is for the King James Version. He has made sure that if you don't like the NIV, the King James Version lovers has a Bible for them. In every one of these Bibles, the study notes were formulated by Francisco Ribera going way back to 1585, a great plot to take the eyes of the reformers off of the true place that Rome had in Bible prophecy. Today, it's known as Darbyism. It's now also called the New Word Dispensationalism. Really, it's really more like sensationalism rather than dispensationalism. No disrespect to those who believe it, but it's not scripturally sound. It's not found in the Bible. The Schofield Study Bible and the study notes are both non-biblical teachings. It's also called the gap theory, where they take the last week in the 70-week prophecy and they cut it off and put it way, way down in some undetermined date in history. In other words, they say that last seven days occur when the rapture happens. So when the church disappears, this theory says, now the seven years begin, the last seven years on the 70-week prophecy. If you want some material, write me at 3ABN. I'll try to get some to you. Now don't all inundate me now. But this is all beautifully packaged for you, for those of you who don't understand this to truly understand this. Because as I said earlier, the devil has cleverly found ways to lead the Christian church down the wrong path. 
In the same way that he's used the hip-hop industry to bring hip-hop music into the church and rock music into the church, he's found a way to bring lies into the church and package it in Christian books. So now, is there anything wrong with the NIV, the New King James and the King James? Be careful with some of the translations. I'm not going to give you an entire study on translations because some of the Bibles take out entire verses. But the problem is the study notes. You see, in the C.I. Scofield, you know, the Scofield Study Bible, if you follow his study notes, here are some of the things you find. You come to discover, based on his notes, he connects texts together that are not interrelated to build the secret rapture. He also connects texts together to make you think that where the Bible mentions the first day of the week, it means the Sabbath. He also connects texts together where there are, is a teaching of eternally burning hell. He makes you believe it is eternal. It took the devil about 500 years to get it to where it is today. But that's not the last contributor in this entire construction of the rapture theory. Schofield study notes talk about the gap theory, the restoration of the nation of Israel. That's why our government has such a push. We've got to defend Israel because our government is pushed by religious individuals who believe that Israel one day is going to be converted. That's the whole thing about the coalition with Israel. Also the conversion of the Jews, the pre-tribulation rapture, and the millennial earthly reign of Christ. Christ is not coming down here to reign with us. We're going up there to reign with him. What do you say? I'm not looking to be on down here a thousand more years. I want to be in the kingdom that he's preparing for me right now. If you read John 14, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again to receive you so that where I am in heaven, there you may be also. Amen. He's not coming down here with us. That's why they're trying to reform the earth, trying to get the earth. God is not reforming this. He's going to make it all over again. He's not putting it up to politicians and, and the Palestinians and the Jews to fix the earth. He's going to do it himself. He's the creator, and he's also the recreator. Amen, somebody. But this trek continued. The next man to contribute to this whole thing was a man by the name of Hal Lindsey. I think I have a picture of his book called The Late Great Planet Earth. Fifteen million copies was sold when it hit the presses. And everybody thought the world was going to end Somewhere in the 1980s, this book hit the presses in 1970, 15 million copies, hot. Once again, it reawakened. You see how the devil works? Just about the time the fire is about to die, he throws another log in there and stokes it to keep a lie flaming from the pulpits of places where the Word of God should be taught. So what did he do? Listen to how Time Magazine says it. This is really interesting. Time Magazine special says, this, by the way, is from time.com by Kayla Webley, and this was May 20th, 2011. This was written. Listen to these words. If you follow Hal Lindsey's, if you follow Hal Lindsey, you probably changed the end of the world date in your calendar several times. His late great planet Earth, which was the best-selling non-fiction book of the 1970s, notice they say non-fiction, they gave it biblical status predicted that the world would end sometime before December 31, 1988. His later books, though less specific, suggested that believers not plan on being on earth past the 1980s, and then the 1990s, and then, of course, the 2000s. But Lindsay did more than just wrongly predict the end of days. He popularized a genre of prophecy books. Oh, if you think Hal Lindsay is the last one, Tighten your seatbelts. Let's go to the next stage. The next great contributor was a man I talked about just a moment ago. His name was Tim LaHaye, and his writer was Jerry Jenkins. The Left Behind series, if you think that 15 million is a lot, this 16-volume series of the Left Behind series, 75 million books were sold. Not to count the movies, not to count the children's series, not to count the literature, and not to count all the non-scriptural Bible studies that were sold and taught from the pulpits of the world. Some of them are still teaching it. Matter of fact, um, Discovery Channel did a, an expose. When Pastor Doug Batchelor was on, they did this thing about end-time prophecies. Some of you may have seen it. In that very same expose, they did a clip on the, on the secret rapture, and they said, and I quote, millions of Christians have embraced a belief in the secret rapture, and it's not supported by Scripture. 
But you know what? You tell a person that believes the rapture that it's not supported by the Bible, you know what they say? They still believe it. One of the greatest deceptions is to look for something that's not going to happen. Waiting to be snatched away only, only to face the tribulation. But I got good news for you. Don't fear the tribulation because the Bible says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Put their thinking caps on. When the plagues came to Egypt, the, the Israelites were there. But what kept them? The blood of the Lamb. God didn't take them out before the plagues fell. All ten plagues fell while they were in Egypt. What protected them? The blood of the Lamb. Revelation 12, verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That's our protection. Not some secret place that's up there in purgatory. Oh, I've got to talk about that tomorrow night. 75 million books and DVDs were sold. Christian churches hosted showing the Left Behind DVDs in their churches. And by the way, it's still sold today as fiction in the Christian bookstores, but most people miss that stamp. Fiction. Here's a slide of Tim LaHaye's book, the Left Behind series. I think they may have shown it already. 75 million books. But I want you to hear what was said about this entire series. This was taken from the Huff Post, BuffingtonPost.com, September 5th, 2001. The author of the popular Left Behind book series, Tim LaHaye, has written on his website, you got to get this, that he does not subscribe to the growing belief that May 21, 2011 will mark the end of the world. The Left Behind series lays out a fictionalized image. Get that. It lays out a, this is what they're telling you, it lays out a fictionalized image of the Christian prediction for the end of the world and suggests that the rapture may be imminent. Now Tim LaHaye still believes in the secret rapture, but what he does not support is the prediction of the dead. He said that Harold Camping is not right. But he still supports the secret rapture. Duh! It's not a very theological word. But in other words, wake up. If, if it's not in the Bible at all, whether you predict a date or not, it's not going to happen. Am I right? Look at the words of Jesus. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then we have the final, not the last, but the final and most significant contributor to the secret rapture. I said to you earlier, if I were the devil, I would come after the church. And boy, Satan is like Mike Tyson without gloves. He's ripping our ears off because we don't want to hear what the Spirit says. And the churches, multiple millions would rather believe the secret rapture than believe the Word of God. They use 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. If you read that verse, it's anything but secret. The Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout. Secret? I haste to say it's not. With the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet. How many times have you heard a silent trumpet? And David the psalmist says, Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. Let me tell you something. New Year's Eve does not happen. It's not a silent event. Amen? The championship of a football game is not celebrated in secret. Neither is the NBA Finals, neither is the World Series for Baseball. Why would the greatest event of the ages be a secret event? Why would the God who loves us come back and say, come on, Dick, let's go. I don't, be, I don't want to be cynical here, but that's what actually people are believing. So somebody be flying an airplane and all of a sudden the, the pilot's gone. Somebody be driving a car. You've seen the posters. In case of the rapture, this car will be unmanned. It's based on a lie. Please do your homework. Don't be caught by something that's not going to occur. I may be excited. Just pray for me. Jesus also warned us. Harold Camping, he predicted that May 21 would be the day of judgment. Here's a picture of a sign that people saw about that thing. Remember this? Judgment Day, May 21, 2011. My wife and I were in Oakland, California around May 21st. We took a picture in front of Harold Camping's building. If I was thinking, I'd have had it on the screen. Nobody was there, but the radio station was still on. And 
On the next day, May 22nd, was our 28th anniversary. I could have told Harold Camping the world was not going to end that day. We had an anniversary celebration. Not that would be the reason why the world doesn't end. But after that, he had, I think, a stroke or something because he was so disappointed that he was, again, incorrect. When you try to predict something that's not going to occur, you will be incorrect over and over and over and over again. You'll never be correct. It's like trying to hit a baseball and there's nobody throwing one. But notice what Jesus said. This one took about 500 years to construct. It is a deception. And loving Christians, people that love the Lord, I'm not talking about people that don't like Jesus. I'm not talking about people that want to be lost. I'm talking about people that sincerely love the Lord. I'm talking about people who are waiting for this great and glorious deliverance out of this cruel, sinful world. But they've been taught. And they've been duped by a lie from the pits of hell. And it's not going to occur. But Jesus warned us that these are days of deception. Matthew 24, verse 11. He says, many false prophets. I listed 10 of them just now. Many false prophets will rise up and what does it say? Deceive many. He also warned his disciples. It's amazing in the outlaying of the last days in Matthew 24. You notice he doesn't mention earthquakes first or wars and fires and floods. He doesn't mention disease first. The first thing he says, Matthew 24, verse 4, look at what he says. First thing he says. Jesus answered and said to them, his disciples, take heed that what, friends? No one deceives you. Do you think he was just picking words? No, he was saying the devil is going to deceive you. Matter of fact, you read Revelation chapter 12, he deceives the whole world. His angels were cast out with him. He's got workers everywhere to deceive the entire world, which takes me down to this quotation, a very powerful one from the book, Christ's Triumphant page 143 in paragraph 2. Notice what it says. It says, The last days are upon us, and Satan is working with all his, his hellish arts to deceive and destroy souls. And he's working most effectively under the guise of Christianity. Now, you know what? A person may come in here and try to sell us drugs, pornography, sex, all that stuff, lottery tickets. Nobody's going to buy that. Am I right? Come on, say Amen. He ain't going to be buying that. But if he packages it in the Bible, now get that, God's holy book, false study notes. Be careful when you study your Bible based on the study notes. Check out the beginning. There are a couple of, not just Schofield study notes, but there are a number of other contributors that follow Schofield's train of thought. And I could show you my Bibles. I have a number of them that the notes themselves, if you follow them, you'll believe all kinds of stuff that's not supported by the text itself. But Jesus said these days would come. Look at this, Isaiah 4 and verse 1. Seven churches, look at what he says about all seven of them. Isaiah 4 verse 1, in that day that is the last day, the motif is the last days. In that day, seven women. How many women? Seven women. That's the seven churches. We'll take hold of one man. Who's the man? Jesus. Saying, we will eat our own food. We've got our own doctrines. We'll wear our own apparel, our own righteousness. Only let us be called by your name, Christian, to take away our reproach. Many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. There are folks that are opening churches up all over the place. You know why? Because it's the biggest taxed shelter in the United States. It's the biggest way to get into people's pockets, to take people's money. You know what? I need to say something for those of you who may not understand where I stand as a pastor. My check doesn't go up or down based on how many people are packed in a building. My check comes in the mail like your check may be direct deposit. So we're not motivated to tell you what you want to hear. We're motivated to tell you the truth. I'm not a pilot that just likes to fly. I want to get you to your destination. Amen? So when you get on the plane, they always say before the doors are closed, the next stop for this plane is Los Angeles, California. If that's not your final destination, please ex exit now. I wish church would say that. Our next destination is heaven. If this church is not taking you there, please exit now. And a whole lot of folk will be walking out. That's why, look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 to 15. 
And my point is, don't determine the truth by the way the preacher looks and sounds, but by what the Bible contains, because Satan has ministers that work for him. That's what Jesus said. Here it is. 2 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse 13. He says, For such are what kind of apostles? False apostles. What kind of workers? Deceitful workers, not transformed by God, but transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, King James Version says, and no marvel. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That's how he came to Jesus in the wilderness. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of what? Righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Everybody's going to have to pay for what they say. Am I right? That's why I'm not going to tell you a lie because I'm not standing before God saying, I didn't mean to lie to them. Uh-uh. Jeremiah 23, listen to it, read it. It says, Woe unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. There's one shepherd, and he says, My sheep will hear my voice. John chapter 10. Other sheep I have that are not of this fold, but he says, Them also I must bring. John 10 and verse 16. So in these last days, God is calling his sheep to follow the only shepherd that tells you the truth, Jesus Christ. But let's keep on going. The Bible also reveals why ministers reject and teach against the truth. John 3 and verse 19. Look at it. The Bible says this, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. And here's the reason why, because their deeds were evil. How many pastors have you seen? And I, I, this is a tender subject. This is a very tender place to tread because the Bible says be careful. Deal with everybody who is in transgression with tender gloves because but for the grace of God, there go us. But so many who are not in the task of standing with integrity and staying in the word and prayed up and staying up are falling like flies because the darkness is revealing that their deeds are really evil. That's what's happening in our world today. Pray for them. But the other reason why many people are rejecting the truth is personal gain. Romans 16, verse 18. I like to use the Bible. That's a good thing to do. What do you say? Romans 16, verse 18. Notice what Paul says. For those who are such... Do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. That's what, you know, we call that praying on folk. Not praying for them, but P-R-E-Y. Praying mantis, trying to find a way into their pockets. I'm sick of that. My stomach turns when I go to a church and I hear ministers lying. I want to stand up, but out of respect, I don't do it. Oh, so many times I was that close to getting up and just blowing the service apart. Now they would have probably beat me up and threw me out. But God is going to deal with that. Deception. Here's another reason why many people don't like the truth. Luke 16, verse 13. Luke 16 and verse 13. Deception. Another reason for this is right in this verse. No servant can serve two masters for he will hate the one and what else love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and what else despise the other you cannot serve God and mammon mammon was a God that was synonymous to money there are a whole lot of people in it for the money and we as pastors in the Adventist church we say you know we're not in this for the money because we're not getting rich being an Adventist pastors, but we got a retirement plan that's out of this world. Can you say amen? I've got fire insurance and life insurance. God has given me security from the fires to come. Isn't that all right? I got life insurance, eternal life in Jesus Christ. So I got to be honest, he's employed me to tell the truth, and that brings me great joy. I'm excited about the audience here, but I'm even more excited about those who are watching, because many of us know this to be true. But those who are lis listening and watching, if you've never heard this before, I want you to pray. If there are things that I've said that you want to know about, contact 3ABN. 3ABN.org, you'll find out about it. We've got a whole staff of pastors that will be glad to walk with you through the Bible. We're living in too late a history to hide the truth from those who want to know about it. People want money. A lot of people want money. There are pastors that talk about their salaries. I remember a preacher once said to me, I have more money in my pocket than you make in an entire year. And I thought to myself, well, that's terrible. But then I also remembered, 
you can't buy your way to heaven. Am I right? You got to go under the blood of the Lamb. Salvation is a free gift. We're saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. He paid for it, and I'm going to accept the gift free of charge. But you know, when you accept the gift, there's some responsibility. Am I right, Glenn? Responsibilities tell the truth. And the end result of those who refer, who prefer a lie in place of the truth, is spelled out here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Follow these words. It's a frightful thing to handle error and to do it in delight. It's a frightful thing to purposefully and intentionally say, I don't want to hear the truth. If somebody's coming to your house, give them bad directions and see if they don't get upset. When they get upset? If somebody want to call you, give them the wrong phone number. See if they don't tell you about it. But doesn't it frighten you that when you tell people a lie, they don't get upset? But when you tell them the truth, they get upset. When you try to open somebody's eyes, they get mad at you. Tell me that the spirit of the Antichrist is not behind that. Tell me that there's a different spirit. So when somebody say, I love the Lord, that doesn't mean a thing to me. If you love me, Jesus said, you'll keep my commandments. That's the test. He that says, I know him and does not keep his commandments, Jesus says, is a liar and the truth is not in him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, it's there. Examine them by the truth. Look at what the Bible says. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. For this reason... God will send them what kind of delusions? Strong delusions. You want to lie? I'll give you a lie. That they should believe the lie. That they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in what? Unrighteousness. You know what? I don't join churches because of music programs any more than I get on an airplane because of the entertainment. I get on an airplane because it's going where I want to end up. Am I right? So there are some churches that got all kind of good music and great choirs and kicking bands and programs, clothes and food for everybody in the line. But I never forget those words in the back of my mind, the echo of Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonderful works in your name and he will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. In other words, you love sin, you embraced it and you thought by giving out clothes that that will buy your way to heaven. Salvation is a free gift. But it's for those that love the truth and those that love Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. That's why in, during the construction stage, during the final construction of the final stage, we only have one safeguard, and that's Jesus and his word. I go back to that map. You know what? My wife and I will be still in Texas somewhere trying to find California if it were not for the map. You can't even say, now I think, I think, <laughs> California's that way. Unreliable, but some people fly by the seat of their pants when it comes to theology. And that seems, we smile. I did that for a particular reason. That is just as cynical and as ridiculous as taking what God clearly says, ignoring it, and still trying to find your way by sticking your finger up in the wind to find California all the way from Florida. Yet there are loving people that are in the bus that think that the bus driver is telling the truth. But the sad reality is, the Bible says, if the blind leads the blind... They both fall into the bit. You know what? People are not blind because they can't see. Jesus made it very clear to the Jewish nation, you have closed your eyes. Lest you see with your eyes and hear with your ears and be converted. When our eyes are open, it leads to conversion. We see the truth, but we also see Jesus more clearly. We are living in a very fragile age. It's time to understand that during the construction of the final stages, again and again, at the end of a rope of destruction, at the end of the road of deception and disappointment, there's a man saying to us, our last text for the night, John 14, verse 6, Jesus is still alive and well today, and he's still calling to those who are in darkness to come to this marvelous light. He's still saying, you don't have to stay there and enjoy the choir and go to hell singing Christian songs. He's saying, I am the way. Look at the text, brethren. Jesus said to him, I am the way. What else, friends? The truth. And what else, friends? The life. No one comes to the Father except through me. My wife and I were in California for two years with the Heritage Singers. Still had that old rusty car, 1976 Toyota Corona, with all of its cancer. It had air conditioning, but the fan didn't work. So the only way to cool down was to drive really, really fast. 
with the air duct open so that it could blow the air. You know, you've got to find ways <laughs> to make the thing work. When we left California, I said to my wife, Honey, we're going to take our time. We don't have to rush. We know we're going to Florida. She says, It took us three days, 1,016 miles a day. I'm not doing that again. We're going to take our time. Guess how long it took us to get home? Three days. <laughs> you know why? Because we had loved ones on the other end. We had family on the other end. We had difficulty in the journey. We got through the deserts of Texas at night one night and our headlights just stopped working. Bam! In the middle of the freeway, the lights went out. I had to pull off the road. Brethren and sisters, when the lights go out, don't drive in the dark. Pull off the road and fix the lights before you continue your journey. We're on our way home. We need our lights. We're driving at night. It's dark out there. Got off the road and fixed the lights. Some of you need to fix the lights. You're driving without lights. Jesus says his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Fix the lights. If your preacher don't have it, get out of that vehicle and get into a vehicle where they have good headlights. Amen, somebody. My wife got tired of driving. She said, I'm not driving anymore. But you know what? I said, that's all right. I'll drive for both of us. She got in that seat and slept. And I remember, I tell you what, when we got through Georgia and we finally saw a sign ahead of us says, Welcome to Florida. I, my wife was sleeping. I said, honey, look at the sign. Welcome to Florida. She was as wide awake as at any other point in the journey. Eyes peeled and wide open. You know why? Because she knew that not far from that sign was home. Brethren, all the signs around us tell us that we are nearing home. Not far from the signs around us in the world says that we're nearing home. It's time to turn the lights on. It's time to walk in the light while we have the light, lest darkness comes upon us. So tonight I want you to bow your heads and I'm going to say a short word of prayer because this is a critical hour. Father in heaven, we thank you for your truth. It's so magnificent. How can we but desire anything but the light in this dark world? I pray that you'll lead those who are sincere, that you'll even open the eyes of some of these preachers that are going awry and give them an opportunity to turn around, pull off the road, turn on the light and follow Jesus as he leads us home. Bless the message that went forth, and may your name be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Friends, don't forget tomorrow night, the message is going to be the final coalition, Power Pact, 7 p.m. Central Time. May God bless you. We look forward to seeing you then. God bless you.